our next speaker, right before lunch, is Ron Alpha, who I'm reading his title here, Senior Vice President of Translational Discovery at Recursion Pharmaceuticals. You heard um, Dr. Park mention Tempol. It's now called Rec 994, um, and that Recursion is a company that is developing that as a possible treatment for CCM. Um, and he also describes himself as Recursion's chief evangelist. So come on up, Ron. Thank you so much, and thank you all for having me. So what I'll try to do here is maybe take you through a little bit of, of how we try to discover medicines in the con and some of the challenges with discovering new medicines um, in the context of giving you a little bit of an update on where we are with um, the REC 994, the Tempal program, as we're moving it towards the clinic for CCM. Uh, so you might all be, you know, everyone's wondering, you know, why aren't, why aren't there new medicines? You know, wh why haven't we already figured out something for this disease and for many other diseases? You know, the challenge is it's not for a lack of effort. So we try really hard to discover new medicines. And um, the challenge is, you know, we put in years and years of effort, lots of great science. And then you get statistics like this where, you know, roughly half of medicines will fail in the in the last phase of clinical development just because they didn't work. Um, and it's not because they weren't safe, they just didn't work. Um, and so that's a, that's a huge challenge for the industry because, you know, you put a lot of time and effort into trying to, to find new medicines. And so why does this happen? Well, um, from a scientific perspective, what we're always trying to do is sort of understand you know, what is, the, what is that one piece of biology that we can make a drug against that's going to help to potentially cure the disease? And so what I'm showing you here is a, a biochemical pathway. So th this poster is on the wall of, you know, high schools and colleges and, like, biochemistry labs. And each one of these lines is sort of the connection between different enzymes that we've come to understand. And you can imagine the process of developing a drug um, from how we take it, is pointing to one of these things and saying, okay, I'm going to make a drug to target that thing, to turn off that enzyme. Um, and you sort of focus in on that one enzyme, but you, it's, you almost fail to appreciate that that enzyme is so intricately connected to, you know, the rest of biology um, that, that, you know, you could be wrong. Or you might not even understand what this whole map looks like. And as a human, I certainly can't understand what even, you know, just this portion of the map looks like, let alone the whole thing. Um, so th this is a big challenge. And, and you know, we try work, we do a lot of great science and we work really hard to sort of understand the biology of diseases and um, it can take a while to, to really be able to understand uh, where we're developing drugs. Uh, so the approach that we took at Recursion is to sort of turn that process on its head. Um, so if you think of, you know, the very first step of discovering a medicine begins with oftentimes uh, doing experiments in human, in human cells. So what I'm showing you here um, on the bottom are um, micro microscopy images of human cells in a dish. And these are the actual cells that form uh, blood vessels. Um, they're not in sort of a blood vessel form. They're just forming a layer on, on a dish um, in an experimental condition. Um, and what we've been able to do is we stain them with you know, different stains that just show different parts of the cell. And I'll just play a little movie here, and you can kind of see it scroll through different regions. These are general portions of the cell that are involved in holding the DNA, cell-to-cell um, -cell movement, the energy uh, source of the cell, the mitochondria. Um, so what we can do is use these stains, and we just label these different parts of the cell. And essentially what we're doing is turning the cell into uh, a facial recognition problem. So, um, you know, if folks have used Facebook, you upload a picture to Facebook, and then it says, hey, is this your friend? Um, and the way it does that is the algorithm looks at, you know, general features of your face, of the face in the picture, ears, eyes, nose, mouth, and it, it sort of draws correlations to other versions of that and says, okay, well, this looks exactly like that picture of your friend from, you know, two years ago where you labeled it with, you know, their name, Joe. Um, is this Joe in this picture? Uh, so that's a little bit of what we're doing here. We can 
um, use the same types of algorithms on cells, and we can take these cells, we can turn off genes, for example, turn off the genes that are involved in uh, CCM, um, and then the cells will respond to those changes in different ways. So let's see if I could use this. So here are just four different ways that cells can respond to these changes and have different shapes. Um, and these are consistent. Every time we, for example, mutate or uh, uh, knock out a CCM gene, the cells will respond in the same ways. And so what that allows us to do then is say, okay, well, um, here is a, here's a cell state where we've, we've taken out, we've broken the gene that's involved in a disease. And here's a cell state where uh, where the cells are normal. They have all their normal genes active. Can we um, look for, um, for drug candidates, so very, very early drug candidates, that can make the cells in this state look back to, look much more like they did in the normal state? And that's what I'm showing you here. Here's a, a drug that um, moves the cell back to the normal state as you increase the concentration of the drug that you put on the cells. And that's what this green line here shows. It's a, it depicts that as we move from left to right, as we increase the amount of drugs on the cell, um, then they, they begin to look more, more normal. Uh, and so that's the approach that we've taken uh, to, to do biology and to develop new drugs uh, for, for uh, many different diseases. And actually, um, I think the really important piece here is the whole company began um, with uh, work out of Dean Lee's lab by Chris Gibson working on the cerebral cavernous malformation. Um, and here, here you know, are some of the very first images from the very first experiments um, where uh, we identified the, the uh, drug that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, and you can, so you can sit back and see, so th these are cells where we, were, where we basically broke um, you know, the gene CCM2 to model CCM. Um, and then these are, you know, what you think of cell, as cells that are in the, in the sort of healthy uh, and normal uh, endothelial state. Um, and you can see that there's uh, very clearly a difference here. Uh, but it wasn't, in, you know, it's very hard to sort of measure that. As a human, I might, I might sit back and say, okay, I'm going to measure, you know, the, you know, this red thing. Um, I, I think I see a lot more green. You know, I could definitely see the differences. But it's just really hard to to, to measure how much of each thing is changing. So this is really where the computer vision algorithms kind of came into play because they allow us to sort of step back um, and just ask the, the algorithms, the machine learning algorithms, to tell us what is different here. You know, as a human, I, I see differences. I don't really know what they are, but you, algorithms can do a much better job of telling us what's different there. Um, and so from, from those early experiments, we were able to identify um, this drug, uh, Recursion 994, Tempol. Um, and then um, uh, from, uh, from there, Chris was able to put, uh, put that molecule into mouse models of cerebral cavernous malformation. Um, in, that, in this particular case, he was looking at uh, mice that are lacking CCM2 in the brain. Um, and he was able to measure, and so here he's measuring uh, the size of the lesions in the mouse using MRI. Um, and what he saw is every time you treated um, with this drug here in white, um, that you begin to decrease the size of the lesion. So mice that have been treated over a long period of time have end up with uh, smaller sized lesions. Um, and he was also able to show that um, treating with, with the drug um, reverses uh, a particular phenotype of these vessels in that they, uh, they, they have a vaso dilatory effect, so they dilate, they expand. Um, and then he was also able to show that in, a, in, in sort of a skin permeability uh, uh, biological test that the, that the drug reverses that. So we have done, so we took those studies and, um, you know, the company was founded a couple years ago um, and we spent a couple years sort of trying to develop the technology, but, you know, um, about two years ago we began um, the process of taking this drug, um, Tempol, Rec994, um, into clinical trials. So. Part of the, pro the challenge with, with a drug that's not been on the market, that's never really been in humans, 
is you you sort of don't know if it's safe yet. Um, you don't know how to give it to patients, um, and it can take a little bit of time to prove all those things. Uh, so this is just a general framework for how you develop any drug, really, um, and how we've been thinking about this drug. So you begin with what's called a phase one trial. Um, here we have it broken up into two different portions. Um, and in phase one, uh, you're really just trying to show that the drug is safe. Um, you're not trying to show that it works in the disease. Um, you're trying to understand um, what dose you can give it at um, in patients where you know there where you won't have any safety concerns, and so uh, what we what we were doing and are currently doing for the phase one is um, treating healthy volunteers. So these are folks that have volunteered to to be enrolled in the study. Um, they show up at a clinical trial site, um, and then they check in and they stay there, um, and then they they receive the drug. And basically, the physicians monitor everything. We take their labs, um, we take uh, history and physicals every day, um, and we just make sure you know they're perfectly safe and ask them everything about you know the, you know what they're feeling and trying to understand what the drug is doing. From there, um, we are able to you know if. If everything proves safe in the first part, then we can move something into what's called a phase two, where we're actually enrolling patients um, and we're trying to measure some sort of a, um, a disease-relevant endpoint. Um, and one of the things that we're working on today is trying to understand, well, what would make, what would prove to us and prove to you that this drug works? Like, what is it that needs to be better um, in order for us to feel like this is an efficacious drug? Uh, so, for example, do we need to show, you know, if it just reduced headaches, is that an efficacious drug? If it reduced seizures, if it reduced bleeds? So that's one of the things that we're currently in the process of trying to understand. Um, so we've made a little bit of progress so far. Um, what we've done is we finished the first part of the safety study, which is where uh, what we do is we, um, with using four different doses, we enroll subjects. These are healthy volunteers again. And we start them at one dose. Um, we run all the safety checks. Uh, and if everything's good, we move them up to the next dose, um, and so on and so forth until we get to you know, the last dose. And so we finish. This is called a single ascending dose study because you start at one dose and you increase the dose. And they're only getting, they, they only get one dose of the drug. And so we finished this portion of the study, um, and it was, uh, so um, one of the things we tried to measure is how does the, the concentration of the drug change in the plasma over time, and you should see it increase um, in a way that's proportional um, to the amount that you're giving, so that's good. So this shows us, you know, one of the, one of the challenges in drug discovery is, you know, if I give you, you know, uh, 50 megs of drug, um, and I give you 100 megs of drug, if they don't increase proportionally, then it's really confusing from the clinical standpoint. We don't know how to dose it. So we're seeing really good uh, dose proportional increases. Um, the other thing that was uh, really nice about this study is, uh, so you, again, you're measuring everything. So if, if anyone says, if someone says, hey, I, I stubbed my toe, that goes into your, that becomes an adverse event, and you, and you say someone stub, stubbed their toe. Um, in this study, what, you know, there were four things that were reported um, um, as adverse events. Only one of them um, was thought to be related to the drug, and it was um, one of the subjects um, said they had a headache on the day of, of taking the drug. So it's about, um, again, so uh, there were four subjects total that reported something. The other three were, um, you know, someone had a skin abrasion, so that was... Um, definitely not related, and then there were a couple that were also thought to be not related to dizziness and palpitation. So this is, you know, this is pretty good for uh, for a study drug and going across four different doses. So we were actually really excited about you know these results. Um, and the next thing that we'll do is is go into a, another study, and we're currently in a study where we're let's just go a little bit faster. Right, we're currently in a study where subjects are getting ten doses of a drug, and then we're escalating. Um, so this study is currently nearing completion, and we've already gone through three doses. Um, and you you have to prove that it's safe before you go to the next one. And so this is ongoing and going really well. Uh, and so the last thing that I'll just talk about is something that is really important to us, and something we think is really important to the community. And we're 
what I mentioned uh, previously when we were talking about the phase two is um, we need to be able to measure um, some effect of the drug to prove to, to ourselves and prove to the community and prove to regulatory agencies that, hey, this thing works. This is meaningful. Um, it's going to help patients. Um, and it's really hard to figure out what that's going to be sometimes. And so one of the things that we've been doing is working with this group at the University of Rochester um, and in cl collaboration with the Angioma Alliance uh, uh, to develop what's called um, a patient reported outcome instrument, um, which we're calling the CCM Health Index. So what is this? This is uh, a questionnaire, essentially, that tries to capture the patient experience um, uh, in a way that it can be measured. So for example, um, if I'm a patient with, you know, it could be any clinical condition, and on any given day, can I fill out this questionnaire where um, uh, that would enable a, a physician, a doctor, to say, okay, um, you know, today Ron's feeling, you know, like a four with regard to, you know, all the features of his particular disease. Um, and then w if, if you can create that sort of questionnaire, then that means now I can um, try a study drug, for example, or I could take a medicine and then see how it changes, you know, my, my global uh, clinical symptom symptomatology. Um, and so this group is really experienced in developing these. They've, um, and they're, they're not sort of a CCM specific group. They are a group that is, are, that are experts in developing these kinds of instruments. Um, and you can see here that they've worked on a lot of different diseases um, to help develop these instruments for clinical trials. Um, so this is sort of a summary of, you know, the way we think about it. Um, it should be able to monitor and measure the things that are the most important to patients. Um, and it should also be able to exclude, you know, things that are you know, maybe not so important that we don't need to measure. So I won't go through the details here, but you know we have sort of a plan to do the, to get this done and, and target completion dates, and we've been able to work with um, uh, folks uh, involved with the NGOMA Alliance, and we're really grateful for everyone that's you know uh, volunteered and, and perhaps will volunteer to participate in this effort. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions about this you know offline as well. Um, and I'll just wrap up because I know we're, we're sort of short on time, but I think, you know, we're making a lot of progress on, on the REC 994 program. Um, I'm really excited, uh, you know, to potentially come back next year and, and tell you more about the, uh, the CCM Health Index, tell you about, you know, the completion of the phase one uh, and, you know, our next plans for the program. Um, and so uh, my, in my last slide, I would just like to, you know, uh, thank the NGO Alliance, Connie. I'd like to thank, uh, you know, some folks that are incredibly uh, experienced in working with patients, working with the science of the disease that have been really helpful for us in thinking about um, how we oop, design a clinical trial. Um, and importantly, I, I want to thank, uh, you know, all the patients that have been involved in this effort and that uh, will be involved in a lot of the work that we're doing in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you.